Welcome to the Lecturio podcast. We understand that medical or nursing school can be challenging, but you don't have to go through it alone. Our goal is to bring you key medical and nursing topics in easy to digest, bite-sized episodes so you can keep learning on the go. In today's episode, we'll be diving into breast cancer. Let's get started. Welcome to Health Talk, your source for in-depth discussions on important healthcare topics. I'm your host, and today we're tackling one of the most prevalent and critical health concerns in women, breast cancer. Breast cancer continues to be the most common form of cancer among women globally. In fact, it accounts for almost 30% of all malignant diseases in women in the United States alone. Yet thanks to advancements in early detection and treatment, outcomes, while still serious, are improving in many cases. That's right. Breast cancer is also the second leading cause of cancer-related death among women in the U.S., just behind lung cancer. Today, we're going to explore what breast cancer is, how it's diagnosed, what the risk factors are, and how healthcare professionals can ensure early detection, which really can be life-saving. So, let's begin by defining what breast cancer actually is. Simply put, breast cancer is a type of cancer that starts in the cells of the breast. These cells undergo what's called malignant transformation, meaning they change and grow uncontrollably. If left unchecked, these cancerous cells can spread or metastasize to other parts of the body. Exactly. Now, it's important to know that not all breast cancers are created equal. The most common type of breast cancer is called infiltrating ductal carcinoma. This type starts in the ducts of the breast, which are the thin tubes that carry milk, and then breaks out into nearby breast tissue. It actually accounts for more than 75% of all breast cancer cases. On the other hand, there are also non-invasive breast cancers, such as ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS. In these cases, the cancerous cells are still within the ducts. They have not yet invaded the surrounding tissue. DCIS is another critical example of why early diagnosis matters. It can often be treated effectively before it becomes invasive. That's where screening plays a vital role. Mammography is one of the key tools we use to detect breast cancer early. A mammogram is essentially a specialized x-ray of the breast, and it's recommended that women start regular screenings around the age of 40, though for those at higher risk, screenings may begin earlier. And beyond mammograms, we also have ultrasound and MRI as additional tools in the diagnostic process. Ultrasound is often used to differentiate between solid masses like tumors and fluid-filled sacs such as cysts. Meanwhile, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is particularly useful for women with a higher genetic risk as it offers higher sensitivity, though it's not used for routine screening. Now, if something suspicious is found on an imaging test, a biopsy is typically the next step. A core needle biopsy is usually the method of choice. This involves removing a small sample of the suspicious tissue, which can then be examined under a microscope to check for cancer cells. This is a pivotal moment because the biopsy doesn't just confirm whether or not there is cancer. It also helps determine the biological profile of the cancer. The tissue will undergo immunohistochemical testing to look for certain molecular markers, which will influence treatment approaches. Exactly. For instance, Clinicians look for estrogen receptors, what we call ER-positive breast cancer, meaning the cancer grows in response to hormones like estrogen. They'll also test for progesterone receptors in HER2, or human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. If HER2 is overexpressed, that opens the door for specific targeted therapies. And that brings us to another critical point, risk factors for breast cancer. Broadly, we categorize them into unmodifiable and modifiable risk factors. So let's start with the unmodifiable ones. These are aspects of your health or genetics that you can't control. The most significant unmodifiable risk factor is simply age. About 90% of all breast cancer cases occur in women over the age of 40. Family history is another key unmodifiable risk factor. If you have a first-degree relative, a mother, sister, or daughter with breast cancer, or even a second-degree relative like a grandmother, your risk is higher. Genetic mutations also play a big role, particularly in the BRA1 and BRA2 genes, pronounced BRCA1 and BRCA2. Exactly. 
People might be familiar with these genes, thanks in part to awareness raised by celebrities like Angelina Jolie, who openly discussed her decision to undergo a preventive double mastectomy after discovering she carried the Barcia1 mutation. Let's dig into what these mutations do. Normally, Barcia1 and Barcia2 are tumor suppressor genes, which means they help repair damaged DNA. But when these genes are mutated, they don't function properly, allowing cells to grow uncontrollably. That's why people who carry these gene mutations are at a significantly increased risk of developing breast cancer, and also ovarian cancer for that matter. And it's why genetic testing is recommended for individuals with a strong family history or for certain populations, such as individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, where the mutation is more common. Right. Now, moving on to modifiable risk factors. These are things you can control. For instance, lifestyle factors such as maintaining a healthy weight are important. Postmenopausally, higher body fat can increase breast cancer risk because body fat contributes to estrogen production. A high fat diet and heavy alcohol consumption can also increase risk. And interestingly, studies have found that breastfeeding is associated with a reduced risk of breast cancer. Women who breastfeed for six months or longer have a lower risk, though it's something that may not immediately come to mind when thinking about prevention. It's fascinating how these various factors interconnect. Biology, lifestyle, and genetics all play a role in cancer risk. But at the end of the day, our best tools are still education and early detection, which is why it's so important for healthcare professionals, including nurses, to encourage regular screenings and pay attention to symptoms patients may bring forward. Speaking of symptoms, let's talk about the clinical presentation of breast cancer. The most common early sign is a new lump or mass. While not every breast lump is cancerous, any change should be assessed by a medical professional through clinical examination and imaging. Absolutely, and we want to emphasize that not all lumps are the same. A cancerous lump is more likely to feel firm or hard with irregular edges, and it may be fixed in place, meaning it doesn't move around easily. But aside from lumps, other warning signs include skin changes, dimpling, redness, or thickening of the skin, or changes in nipple appearance, such as inversion or unusual discharge. Interestingly, most breast cancers tend to occur in the upper outer quadrant of the breast, close to the armpit. However, they can develop anywhere in the breast, and it's not uncommon for cancers to involve multiple sections of the breast or even appear in both breasts simultaneously in rare cases. And if the cancer metastasizes, meaning it spreads from the breast to other parts of the body, it might cause other symptoms depending on where it lands. For instance, metastases to the bones can cause back or leg pain, while metastasis to the lungs might result in shortness of breath or a chronic cough. This is important for both patients and healthcare professionals to watch out for, especially in routine follow-ups for those who've already been diagnosed. Now, when it comes to treating breast cancer, how advanced the cancer is plays a huge role and that's where staging comes in. In breast cancer, we use something called the TNM system to describe how far the cancer has spread. That stands for tumor, node, and metastasis. Let's break that down. T stands for tumor, indicating the size of the tumor itself. A smaller tumor, say less than two centimeters, is a T1 tumor, which usually points to a lower stage, often with a better prognosis. Larger tumors would be categorized as T2 or higher, going all the way to T4 when the tumor has spread into nearby structures, like the chest wall. N denotes whether cancer has spread to the lymph nodes. If it hasn't, that would be categorized as N0, but if nearby lymph nodes are affected, you might see something like N1 or N2. The more lymph nodes involved, the higher the risk that the cancer has already begun to spread to other parts of the body. Finally, M stands for metastasis. If the cancer has metastasized, meaning it has spread to distant organs like the lungs, liver, or bones, that would be designated as M1. If there's no sign that cancer has moved beyond the breast and lymph nodes, it would be staged as M0. Which brings us to the overall stage of the cancer, ranging from stage 0 to stage 4. Stage 0 essentially refers to non-invasive cancers, such as DCIS, which aren't spreading yet. Stage 1 refers to small contained tumors without lymph node involvement. As we go up the scale, 
Stage 3 means more extensive lymph node involvement. Stage 4 indicates metastatic cancer, where cancer has spread to other parts of the body. The staging system is crucial because it guides treatment approaches. For instance, at early stages, like stage 1 or stage 2, a lumpectomy, also known as breast-conserving surgery, might be recommended. But in more advanced cases, a mastectomy, which removes the entire breast, may be necessary. The goal is to choose the right treatment while preserving as much of the patient's quality of life as possible. And after surgery, radiation is often used to target any remaining cancer cells in the breast or nearby tissues. Radiation therapy, or RT, works by damaging the DNA of the remaining cancerous cells, making it harder for them to continue dividing and spreading. Now, hormone therapies also play a big role, especially for cancers that are ER positive or PR positive. Medications like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors work to block the hormones that fuel these cancers' growth. HER2 positive cancers, on the other hand, can be treated with targeted therapies such as trastuzumab or pertuzumab, which are specifically designed to block HER2 receptors. This is where the real potential of personalized medicine comes in. We're no longer just treating breast cancer as one disease, but tailoring treatments based on the molecular profile of each patient's tumor. And of course, chemotherapy remains an important option, particularly in more advanced or aggressive cancers like triple negative breast cancer. However, it's important to note, and this is vital for our listeners working in healthcare, different cancers require different approaches. Triple negative breast cancers, for example, don't respond to hormone therapies or HER2-targeted therapies. They're instead treated primarily with chemotherapy, often combined with immunotherapy in certain patients. For healthcare providers, especially nurses, being aware of these distinctions is critical, not only for treatment, but also for educating patients. Many patients are understandably anxious after a diagnosis, and having clear communication around the type of breast cancer, its treatment options, and what to expect can help alleviate some of that fear. You're absolutely right. And when it comes to advanced or metastatic breast cancer, the goal shifts less from cure to managing the disease and improving quality of life. Hormone therapy, targeted therapy, chemotherapy, and even immunotherapy are all key players in these cases. Radiation can still be used, but more often for palliative reasons, aimed at relieving symptoms like pain. To wrap things up, our message is clear. Early detection makes all the difference. Encourage regular self-exams, ensure mammograms are part of routine health checks, and stay alert to changes like new lumps, skin dimpling, or nipple changes. Early detection dramatically improves outcomes, with cure rates for stage 1 breast cancers as high as 87% or more. And as healthcare providers, we have a responsibility not only for diagnosis and treatment, but also in educating patients. Knowing the signs, understanding their risk factors, and staying informed are the first lines of defense in the fight against breast cancer. Thank you all for listening to Health Talk today. We hope this discussion gave you valuable insights into breast cancer, from its clinical presentation to treatment options and the importance of early detection. Stay proactive about your health and continue to advocate for screenings in your communities. We'll see you next time on Health Talk. Stay safe, stay informed, and always advocate for your health. If you're looking for extra support during your healthcare journey, Lecturio is here to help you succeed. Explore Lecturio Premium and start your seven-day free trial today. Remember, with Lecturio, you have expert guidance by your side, anywhere, anytime.